are now listening to The Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. You recently wrote a book called At War, and it's about the military industrial complex. Can you describe that to the listeners, please? Sure. Yeah, well, I actually use the phrase military internet complex as a sort of slight variation on what President Eisenhower coined the military industrial complex. And what I'm talking about here is it's really an alliance between two large and powerful groups. On the one hand, you have the U.S. military and the U.S. intelligence community, and specifically the National Security Agency, which is the largest intelligence agency and is primarily responsible for breaking into computer networks overseas and stealing secrets about our adversaries. And the second group in this complex are the companies that essentially run our digital infrastructure. So companies like uh, internet service providers, telecommunications companies, even some marquee companies like Google, for instance. And what these two forces have done is kind of come together broadly speaking, for the purposes of sharing information and intelligence about hackers, about threats to on computer networks, people who are trying uh, to break in and steal information or disrupt systems or disable physical infrastructure that's connected increasingly to our networks. And these two forces are kind of coming together for the purposes of defending cyberspace. And the, the government has, in recent years, decided that that mission of defending in cyberspace from intruders and hackers is one of the most important national security priorities, even on par with countering and preventing terrorism. And this military internet complex is sort of the way we both protect cyberspace now, and increasingly the way that the government and even some companies are fighting it. Right. I've seen you note publicly with actually a lot of conviction that it's quite evident that um, North Korea was involved with the hacking of, of Sony Pictures and, um, you know, providing a lot of that, that information and those information leaks. Um, there's also another school of thought that says that, uh, you know, maybe North Korea wasn't as involved as many might think. What to you makes this so definitive uh, that allows you to state with conviction that it was, you know, North Korea that was involved with uh, the Sony Pictures hacking? It's a great and it's a very important question. You know, when, when the information first came out in late November, early December, that seemed to point towards North Korea being behind this, um, eventually the government was compelled to, to come up and make their case. And so on December 19th, the FBI came out and President Obama spoke and said, well, we know it's North Korea because we've seen these particular internet addresses being used in the attack and we think those other North Korean hacking incidents. Uh, and also there are signs uh, in the code that was but there were some parts where it was written in Korean and therefore we think North Korea. And a lot of people, myself included, looked at that and said, that's not going to cut it. That's simply not enough information to definitively say that it was North Korea. Right. The thing that really persuaded me and a lot of people was a couple of weeks later when the FBI director, um, Jim Comey, uh, came out and gave a speech at Fordham uh, Law School in New York. Oh. Uh, in which he said that um, and the FBI released more information at that point, too, that was a little more persuasive. But the really, besides the technical information, the thing that really I found persuasive was that Jim Comey said, there are not many things in this life that I am certain about. I have very, very high confidence in this, that North Korea is behind it. So for Jim Comey, whom I know is a really, you know, has a, a reputation of being a straight shooter, for the FBI director to put his personal reputation on the line publicly in that way, when there's this much controversy around it, I think was actually even more persuasive than the technical data that they released that day in addition to what had already been released. And we should have the technical data uh, was uh, uh, not so subtly hinting that reason that we know it's North Korea is because we've been inside North Korea's networks and we can see what they're doing. And then the New York Times broke that story a few uh, few. Later. So I think at this point, it's I'm, I'm persuaded that you know the government um, has very good penetration into North Korean networks, uh, and if Jim Comey is willing to put his professional and personal reputation on it, uh, I, I find that pretty persuasive. In terms of information espionage, I know that you're talking about a lot of credibility and 
um, evidence. We, we've seen, I guess, during the second Gulf War, there was a lot of conviction that there were nuclear weapons within Iraq, you know, and people like Colin Powell were, were testifying, providing what they believed was smoking gun evidence. Is there some room for error here, Shane, or you're saying that you're pretty convinced about this? Sure. There's always going to be room for error. And I think that's one of the reasons why the the government was, or sorry, why, why technology experts and, and, and people like me who follow this very closely were so skeptical in the beginning because the information that had been presented originally was IP addresses and it was, you know, malware signatures, things right. that could be faked, things that are general. And it wasn't until we really kind of learned more about it that I think we got a higher confidence. And I should say, too, you know, one of the things that you frequently hear people in cybersecurity talking about, the attribution problem. That's what we're talking about right now is how do you attribute an attack to a specific actor, a specific country, with enough confidence that you could take action against them and know you've got the right, the right bad guy. Um, right. The government is actually a lot better at attribution than they let on. And the reason that they are is because we have managed to get inside so many foreign governments' networks. And actually, we have networks of human spies. We have very good penetration of a lot of our adversaries. And the government doesn't necessarily want to tip its hand about that, um, and because that would obviously tip off the people we're playing on. But you right. underline an important point here. You have to take each one of these cases individually, because we should not get to the point particularly when we're talking about something as complex as cyberspace, where we're just taking the government's word for it in every case. The Sony case was different. There was a lot of work, including the president himself, mm-hmm. being put behind that. But we do have a lot of experience with the WMD Iraq of people being wrong. And even in the Sony case, we should continue you know, digging and looking for that. And if there is information that comes out that says, guess what, Comey may have believed to his core that this was right, but it simply wasn't, we have to be prepared for, for that eventual, that, that possibility too. But in this case, I think, you know, we can, uh, you know, the happy skepticism is good but in this North Korea case. I, I just personally am persuaded that North Korea was involved in this. Okay. And in terms of the internet getting shut down effectively in North Korea for, I guess, at least tw- uh, 24 hours, who do you suspect? I know that you never so far uh, mm. pinpointed anyone yet, but based on you know your your research and expertise on this, who do you think it would be safe to assume was involved with that? Well, it's, it's a great question. I don't know if it's safe to assume uh, in this one, but so there's one theory of the case, which is that the North Koreans possibly disabled their internet on their own because they were afraid that a retaliation was about to come from the United States. That's one possibility. A second, poss- a second possibility is that you know China could have done this. Most of the internet, uh, nearly all of the internet connections in North Korea, of which there are very, very few, should that um, go through China and actually through a single service provider in China. Um, the Beijing has not uh, been all too happy with the new Korean dictator Kim Jong Un. Uh, this could have been, you know, an opportunity to sort of give him a slap uh, and let him know, like, listen, you know, stand down. We're paying attention. The reason why I think that it's probably not the United States behind it um, is. That, you know, we came out and we put economic sanctions on North Korea pretty quickly afterwards. There, it was a little bit confusing because in the first days, um, the administration was kind of coy when asked by reporters, was the United States responsible for this? Right. They kind of, then they came out and they said with the sanctions that this was the first step in our uh, retaliation against North Korea. And, and you know, unless, they've, unless they're deliberately trying to mislead us here, I think what they were trying to say in so many words was, um, you know, the sanctions are us, this other internet outage is not us, at least not directly. Um, but certainly it, it sent a very clear message to North Korea that uh, uh, your internet infrastructure is quite brittle and quite vulnerable. And if someone wanted to take a flying, uh, I think experts agreed they could, they could do that quite easily. Right. So, so Shane, I'm actually here in Asia right now, and you mentioned earlier the the presence of China. Um, Let's talk about China for a minute. You've written in the past about Chinese hacking activities against U.S. corporations. Can you cite some interesting examples that might be relevant to listeners? And how big of a threat do you think uh, the Chinese are? Well, the Chinese, I think, have to be seen as the number one uh, aggressor when it comes to uh, industrial espionage, economic espionage. <laughs> um, the list of companies that they have targeted 
I mean, it, it pretty much covers the gamut of every conceivable industry. Uh, and the reason that China is interested in hacking U.S. companies is because it wants to get information not only to be competitive against those uh, companies in the global market, but to find out where they're going to get that advantage on them, uh, to know where uh, uh, to have an, an advantage in negotiations with individual companies, and to steal intellectual property. The biggest ones we've seen, if you go back to 2007, when I think it really started to get a lot of notice, is that Chinese were targeting defense contractors. So in particular, I read about the book with Lockheed Martin, which at the time and still is working on a program called the Joint Strike Fighter, which is the most expensive uh, weapon system the Pentagon ever had. This is the sort of next generation fighter aircraft for the military. And they were going in and stealing information on the plane's design, on its aero dynamics on its guidance systems, a whole host of things that could possibly help the Chinese know how to build a plane like that, but more importantly would help the Chinese know how to uh, defend or deter that aircraft if they ever were to, to meet it in combat. So, and then some of the other ones we've seen that have been very high-profile cases, uh, which actually might be linked to China or even possibly to Russia, uh, are uh, there was a there was a very big hack on the on J.P. Morgan uh, right. last year, uh, where hackers got into um, a system of um, account data and could have gone a lot further. It seems as well that would have get, that gave them the opportunity to see information on J.P. Morgan's accounts. Um, we've seen instances overseas. Uh, companies like, for instance, Saudi Aramco, which is a very large uh, oil company in Saudi Arabia, uh, yeah. whose uh, computers were wiped clean of data, about 30,000 computers, by an attack that's been attributed to Iran. So we, we've really seen some some pretty aggressive uh, uh, attacks, if you want to call them that. I kind of you know think it's a rather loaded term, but uh, against some pretty marquee companies, uh, both in the United States and abroad. As you know, Shane, it's been um, quite controversial in the South China Sea um, over the last few years. And uh, aside from the, the disputes over islands here, there's been many instances in which um, the Internet cables underwater have been disruptive in some shape or form. Now, there's countries like Vietnam that will accuse China of um, interfering with with their internet, I don't know if you have any additional insight on something like this. No, I haven't seen so much of that, but I mean, it would it would definitely let's just say it would fit within the, sort of the ambit of how China sort of sees cyberspace as a place where it can gain uh, what's called asymmetric advantage <clears throat> against other countries. You know, the China does not have um, a blue water navy. That is a navy that can go far out shores and, and challenge a country as, as strong as the United States. Uh, one of the reasons we've seen China in naval operations sort of flexing its muscle in the South China Sea is it's trying to establish some kind of regional dominance as well. Um, but in a, just a military-to-military context, China uh, doesn't really stand up to the countries, ours in particular. And so what they've done is looked at cyberspace as a place to gain asymmetric advantage, to be able to conduct uh, intelligence operations like um, uh, um, economic espionage, to be able to uh, probe these systems that control the electrical power grid in the United States, to be able to do things remotely that might have uh, an orders of magnitude greater effect, um, but not in this sort of what's called a kinetic military space. So they see cyberspace as a place where they can go toe to toe with a nation that they cannot challenge in a conventional military setting. Yeah, I had uh, discussed with you about a book that I was um, browsing through called um, Unrestricted Warfare that was written by uh, a few Chinese generals talking about, um, you know, lawfare, economic warfare, network warfare. One of the interesting things was I was just in Singapore discussing with Jim Rogers about the role that the Chinese are starting to have in capital markets. They're starting to play a bigger role in terms of uh, becoming bigger uh, stock exchanges or commodities futures exchanges. They're mm -hmm. playing a much larger role in terms of the volume of um, traded activity for some of the bigger commodities. So it, it's quite interesting that you mentioned to me that as potentially as a form of defense, North Korea may have shut down their internet. I could imagine from this new paradigm of like unrestricted warfare that if you can corner the market on a few key commodities or pillars of 
uh, economies and and own their stock exchanges, like the equivalent of the Nasdaq in in New York, that you could potentially maybe even shut down a market, and it would have a significant impact on commodity prices the world over. Yeah, it's kinds of scenarios that um, of a hacker sort of in a very specific and targeted way trying to do damage by manipulating data, essentially, right, by controlling access to information. <clears throat> um, uh, it's something that national security officials in the U.S. have been aware of for some time. And actually, there's a, there's a great anecdote I'll, I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, so in 2007, President George W. George w. Bush was having a meeting in the Oval Office with his senior national security advisors. Uh, and the director of national intelligence at the time, a guy named Mike McConnell, who used to run a uh, national security agency, wanted to explain to the president how vulnerable the U.S. financial system actually was to hackers. And the way he did it was by saying, you know, Mr. President, if on 9-11 – the terrorists who attacked the World Trade Center, if rather than flying planes into buildings, they had launched a computer attack and had accessed the, the networks of a major bank or a stock exchange, a trading system, and had manipulated or corrupted the data inside the system or inside the accounts such that the bank or the institution could no longer have confidence that the data was accurate and couldn't sort of wind back the tape to when it was accurate – you would insert so much, uh, you would undermine confidence in the data so much that the system would have to shut down and there would be ripple effects after that. You'd have a panic. And the economic consequences, McConnell said, of that action would have been greater than the economic consequences of the physical attack on 9-11, which we remember actually exacerbated what was already a pretty bad recession. And Bush was actually somewhat incredulous about this, this idea that people on computer years would cause this kind of financial panic. And he turned to Henry Paulson, who was his Secretary of the Treasury at the time, and of course the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, and he said, Hank is what Mike is saying true. And Paulson says, Mr. President, not only is it true, but when I was running Goldman, that is the scenario that kept me up at night more than anything else. That is wow. the thing we feared. And the president really, really surprised Bush, and it uh, 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 convinced him to launch a new, at the time, secret initiative to try and bring all of the whole of government together to figure out essentially how do we stop that from ever happening. Uh, so this has really been kind of a, a nightmare scenario that's been on the minds of national security officials and people in the financial community now for some time. Yeah, that's very interesting. Shane, let's let's talk about the Prism uh, surveillance system for a second. Big companies, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, are all involved in this. Can you give us a brief synopsis on this and and the relationship between the NSA and these companies? Sure. In terms of like the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, you mean sort of the, the more the the new tech companies? Yeah. yeah, the new tech companies. Yeah. So what you see there, it's interesting. It's very, it's a much more, I would say, uneasy relationship than what you see from the companies like your sort of big marquee uh, defense contractors that have a much longer history of working with the government. So on the one hand, you've got these voluntary kind of relationships where a company like Google, for instance, back in 2010, discovered that it had been hacked by China uh, and that uh, hackers had stolen some of the intellectual property that uh, relates to Google's sort of uh, its source code, kind of how Google is Google and how it Googles. So a very big and important piece of information. They uh, decided to go public with this information and they informed the government that they were going to do that. The day after Google went public with that, they signed a secretive partnership agreement with the National Security Agency, the details of which we still don't fully understand, but basically what it allows for is Google and the NSA to share information with each other about hackers and threats specifically trying to target Google's networks. And it looks like trying to create some kind of early warning system uh, about ha threats to the network. <clears throat> On the other side of the equation, you've got uh, the NSA and the FBI running surveillance programs whereby they come to companies like Google and Facebook and Yahoo with court orders that say, we are commanding you to hand over information about your customers, uh, uh, the following email addresses, the following IP addresses. What we see here is whether or not it's voluntary or whether or not it's legally compelled. The, the, the common theme here is that these companies – really control the networks. They're the ones with the data. And the government needs the data. 
Right. It can't simply just go. The government doesn't control these networks. 85% of the internet infrastructure in the United States is privately owned. Mm -hmm. So unless the government has the cooperation, either voluntary or legally compelled, of those companies, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible in some cases, to get access to the information that the government needs to track terrorists, to uh, prevent hackers, to find out what's going on in foreign countries. So the companies really are just integral to this entire exchange. Uh, and in, without them, uh, the government is is nearly blind in many cases. Is there any revenue that can be made uh, in terms of the cooperation with the NSA, or is it wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and you will get some additional government contracts for some of these companies? There, there is some revenue, but it's really quite small. I mean, if, if, if the government comes to a company and says, with a warrant and says, we need the following email accounts, they're required to compensate them for the time it takes to actually go get the data. But it's, you know, it's, it's a relatively insignificant amount of money for these big companies. I think that more of the point that you're making is that there is something to be gained by being seen by the government as a company that's willing to play ball on right. cybersecurity that's willing to say we're going to share some information about you with you about threats to our network but we should also emphasize here too that a lot of companies including ones by the way that do voluntarily share information with the government get very very concerned about what legal liabilities they may face yep. if they are sharing information that relates to their individual customers information that very well might be private or governed by privacy laws. And for a number of years now, companies who the government wants to participate more in cybersecurity have been saying, look, you've got to pass a law that gives us some sort of legal kind of immunity or indemnification in case our customers want to come back and sue us at some point. So you've got to give us more protection if what you want is more information. So it's not as if these companies have just completely thrown up the door, opened the doors and said, come on in NSA, sit on our networks. There is information sharing going on. But when the government pushes for more, many of these companies say, not so fast. You've got to give us some assurances that if we hand over information to you that might be considered private, that we're not going to get sued for doing that. Have you had a chance to observe like the increase or growth of revenue from the government from the government for some of these private companies as they've continued to uh, walk this NSA type row? I think that would be such an interesting correlation and observation. In other words, if there are companies that are participating more, are they getting more government contracts? Correct. Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't seen that specifically, um, but it would be something good to study. That sort of relate. We should definitely observe that and see if yeah, an index. We should can check be that made. out to see if that index exactly. <laughs> I mean, one thing that is definitely true is, especially for the big defense contractors, um, you know, the United States is no longer the Cold War is over, and the U.S. is no longer in the business of building huge missile arsenals, and uh, the defense budgets are being cut back for conventional weapon spending. It is the case that these big, big companies that for years really uh, found their revenue and their profit in those big weapon systems now have to find something else to sell to the government. All these defense contractors that were once so vulnerable to Chinese hackers and were told back in 2007, your networks are being overrun, they all now want to get into the cybersecurity business. They've gotten much, much better at defending their networks, and they want to sell cyber solutions to right. the government. Cyber is the only part of the defense budget that is really consistent growing. Um, it's never going to probably reach the levels of spending that we're talking about with Cold War weapon spending, mm -hmm. but these companies have got to make money someplace. And right now, the growth market is cyber, and that's where they're really focusing their attention. One of the interesting themes that um, we've been discussing about on, on the show and just following is basically the privatization of profits and the socialization of risk. So it kind of fits the theme. And what I mean by that is that, say, for example, um, cybersecurity and, and big data analytics of, I guess, um, important information that is contracted out by the government to these private companies is the privatization of, of revenue for some of these companies, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about the, the safety net that, that these companies, uh, for example, if they're concerned about what could happen in terms of a backlash from their customers, it seems as if by you cooperating, there's some social safety net. So it's the privatization of profits, 
the socialization of quote unquote risk. Mm. And uh, it'd be very interesting to see, like, I can imagine, I'm sure there's some case examples where if you're not cooperating with the um, NSA, we've heard instances where the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, then can go and maybe penalize you for, you know, X, Y, Z filings and documentations sometime down the line. I don't know how well coordinated the NSA, FBI, Securities Exchange Commission are, but I'd imagine that they're, they've improved uh, post 9-11 to work in tandem with each other in, in some capacity. Yeah, I think that maybe you're, you're hinting at here, too, some allegations that Joe Naccio, the former CEO of Quest, made uh, a number of years ago, yes. uh, where he, he, he tried to claim that by not playing ball with the NSA on one of its secret spying programs that he was you know, investigated and penalized. And I, I have no reason to believe that's true. But what is true is, let's just take Quest as an example. Right. Back in 2001, after the 9-11 attacks, the government came to all of the major telecom providers and some of the more medium-sized ones like Quest at the time and said, we want access to your call records. We need to see who's calling whom from overseas in the United States. And they wanted to do this without ask, without a warrant. They wanted to do mm-hmm. it under the authority of the president. And Quest was the only company that said no. Now, by saying no, they made themselves not persona non grata, but they kind of stuck out. And that antagonized and annoyed uh, uh, the government. Right. Does that then factor in subtly into negotiations in the future? Possibly. Um, (laughs) It's certainly, you know, it's certainly the case that in 2007, when uh, the government came to, the Pentagon came to major defense contractors and said, there are Chinese hackers in your network and they're stealing our classified information that you, our contractors, possess. It was made very clear to them, you know, if you want to continue doing business with the government, we, this is unacceptable. You're going to have to open up your networks and you're going to have to do more to, to protect this data. You know, the Quest example is, is, is quite extreme because there were aspects of that surveillance program the NSA was running that were later found to be illegal. Right. Uh, and I think Quest did the right thing by stepping up and saying, come back with a warrant if this is what you want. But there are these sort of subtler ways, I think, where the government can, ins- can influence and exert pressure. A company like Google or a Facebook, though, is fortunate in that regard in that they don't make any money off of government contracts. So what they're really trying to do, I think, is particularly post-Snowden, is more be seen as kind of an antagonistic force to the government. We're here protecting your data, and we're not looking at the government. I uh, get it. But there are ways they are going to be cooperating. It's just, it's just going to be a matter of what is the purpose of it. If it's if it's general information about hackers, maybe that's one thing where Google is willing to share. If it's handing over email accounts on customers, Google is going to say, no way, not unless you come with a warrant and it's a court has signed off on it and we understand what the law compels us to do. Shane, do you think that this is one of the reasons why countries like China have effectively banned companies like Google in order for them to develop their own search engines like Baidu and their own social networks? Is Besides the, the service facility that these companies provide, is there also an information intelligence concern that makes China want to at least step up, step up their, I guess, um, firewall, their great firewall from these companies in in order to incubate their own companies. Yeah, there is. I mean, what, what, what China is threatened by when it comes to Google is the fact that Google is not interested in censoring internet content in China, or at least professes that it's not. And so in that sense, Google poses an intelligence threat to China because it can be providing information to Chinese citizens about what their government's actually doing and what's actually going on in the world, whereas China would like to maintain more censorship over what its citizens can see. So Google is a threat in that regard. Certainly post Edward Snowden, it is the case that I think that a lot of foreign countries, including China, probably think that our companies are much, much more in cahoots with with the government uh, and could be passing along information uh, to the government as well. Uh, you know, there's, you know, we get Huawei, the Chinese telecommunications company, right. gets a lot of grief from the U.S. because it's seen as sort of being uh, in bed with the Chinese authorities and a proxy for them. Uh, well, you know, what about companies like Cisco in the United States that are actually very close to the U.S. government and construct technology in a way that the uh, the NSA can tap into if it needs? So, you know, our hands aren't entirely clean on this either.
So in your construction of this book, were there any companies, because we're uh, talking to an investor audience, are there any companies you think that are highly levered um, to cybersecurity um, that crossed your eye? Uh, expand on what you mean by that highly levered to cybersecurity. I guess, like, were there any companies that you could just easily imagine m- making a lot of revenue off this this new mm-hmm. trend? This, despite you know some of the concerns about this, this clearly seems to be uh, a, a, a mega trend that's happening within the the global marketplace right now. And yeah, do you think that there's some companies that are going to be inherently positioned to benefit from this trend? Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is um, the, the big companies in this space that have had probably the best past couple of years, including in their IPOs, uh, are companies like Mandiant and FireEye. And there's a company called CrowdStrike uh, that is run. And a lot of these companies, by the way, are run by former government and law enforcement and military and intelligence officials who did all of the cyber stuff when they were in government. These companies have really kind of become sort of more marquee names, if you like, uh, in, in the space, uh, largely because they've done some pretty, uh, um, had some pretty big clients uh, and done some really compelling reports on uh, Chinese cyber espionage in particular and kind of position themselves in the forefront of being the smart guys on this. But there are just all kinds of companies that we're seeing uh, startups, uh, especially right now in Silicon Valley. Uh, I, I interviewed uh, somebody once who had been an NSA employee for about four or five years. They'd actually paid for his computer science degree uh, and at the undergraduate level. And he uh, had a deal with them where he had to do four to five years with the NSA to pay them back. And then he went out and started his own company uh, and doing cybersecurity. So this is really a big growth market. And and what's going to happen is that a lot of these smaller firms that are staffed and started by computer scientists, by people who may have worked in government, are going to have a lot of expertise And they're going to be in a position to really become acquired by larger companies. So another trend that we've seen in the past couple of years is the big defense contractors going out and acquiring small cybersecurity startups where maybe they have a particular technology they're developing or a particular expertise or a particular set of employees with great connections and access to an agency. And these big companies kind of consume them. We were talking earlier about how the defense contractors need to get in on the cyber uh, market in government in particular. So we've yeah. seen a lot of M&A activity around that in that space. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's, I think it's generally believed to be a very good time to be starting a cybersecurity company if you're in the tech space. That's interesting. One of the big themes that we're also talking about is basically the the bigger getting bigger. The oligarchs are getting bigger and they're being run by the plutocrats and technocrats. Technocrats are very important to this whole cybersecurity because there's only a a small percentage of people that understand what's actually happening here. Um, so it's interesting to hear that it's also the big defense contractors that are going out, rolling up some of these smaller companies and using uh, M&A and capital markets for these acquisitions. We see the same trends in uh, financial services, all sorts of different sectors, Shane. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is after a, a certain amount of roll up does happen and the oligarchs acquire all the companies they need for anyone else that wants to get this into the space then suddenly we're starting to see regulation um, that restricts uh, more players from entering the market after a certain period of time so right now it sounds like cyber security is still very open to disruption because it's based on technology which is based on disruption but after yeah. a period of time i think that there's going to be companies that are going to be restricted from entering this space despite how lucrative it's going to be um, once all the big defense companies have rolled up you know uh, a handful of these small companies so definitely a trend to look out for this is a very fascinating conversation shane i still got a few more questions and sure let's, let's try to finish up soon um this is the favorite question i've been waiting all day actually to ask you about this i don't know if anyone's asked you about this but i want to be the first if possible there's a big hacktivist organizations anonymous they're playing a very big role in terms of social issues implementing basically cyber warfare to i guess make like moral uh causes that they feel relevant uh putting them on the map and and you know going up against the uh, the kkk 
KKK, right? And going up against a few states as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think about hacktivists and their role in this? Because I don't know if it's, I know you talk about sovereign states and terrorist organizations. I guess hacktivists is a, a separate group. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we, we if you're taking a group like Anonymous, like Lulzsec, um, you know, from the government's perspective, these are groups that are just, you know, it's a very black and white kind of thing. The government sees them as groups that are engaged frequently in illegal activity and in harassment, and it wants to shut them down and has really targeted them. Um, you know, I, many of these groups are actually, as you pointed out, are going out and trying to do things like hold officials accountable and and root out malfeasance uh, and are sort of, you know, in, in, exerting some kind of, you know, maybe vigilante justice on the Internet. And I, I think this is fascinating on the one hand because some of these groups are just going out and finding information and then exposing it and making public things that maybe didn't have a lot of uh, light on them, which frankly is what I do as a journalist. But then when you get into the realm of people stealing information or breaking into systems to expose information, you're entering into a very gray area. I mean, on the one hand, you know, you're, you're, you're engaged in illegal hacking, but let's just put that aside for a second. You know, sort of what is the morality of a group like Anonymous going out and targeting people or going out and um, deciding that it's going to uh, make one individual its special project and expose as much private information as it can? It's, it's, it, it leads to the question a little bit of like, well, who made you judge and jury? Right. Um, but, you know, I, I've been trying to just more understand it from the point of view of the phenomenon that it represents of, you know, people who clearly live in a way in cyberspace and feel very comfortable there and are sort of <clears throat> building up their own code of conduct of, of, uh, and, and able to, to act on what they see as injustices. That sort of just flips the whole kind of power paradigm that we think about. Of you know, in in a traditional sense, we depend on government to go out and right wrongs, or journalists to go out and expose people. And now, it, to some degree, hacktivist groups, if we want to call them that, are, are playing that function uh, as well. And so I, we're we're just beginning to understand why they do what they do. And certainly even within their own communities, there are people who will say, you know, that was going too far or we should, you know, we, we should limit ourselves to only legal activity. Um, but they're, they're a, definitely a, an aspect of life in cyberspace that is something that we're going to have to, to better understand. Uh, and I think, you know, from the government's point of view, maybe they should do a little bit more to rather than trying to just simply lock all these people up to try and understand what their motivations are and uh, what their skills are, frankly, because who knows, maybe there are some people who are working in these groups that could be persuaded to, to come help the government, uh, you know, root out information on, on criminals and on bad people. I mean, maybe it's being a little bit fanciful and too optimistic, right. but, but these are certainly folks who, who live in the world of cyberspace and are very comfortable there. And the government needs to be doing in a general sense more to reach out to those kinds of people because it needs help and it needs expertise too. What's interesting about groups like that is I, I hear that their process of determining what causes and issues that they should turn attention to is based on somewhat of a democratic vote system this mm. via like message board where all the participants of say, for example, anonymous, um, tally their votes to what what they think is important. Um, I'd also would wonder about the the composition in terms of the demographics of um, these hacktivist groups. It seems to me as if they're probably uh, their composition of demographics is probably made up of more minorities um, relative to the plutocrats and oligarchs in, I guess, the functioning economy and, and politics. So it, it seems as if it's almost somewhat of a counterbalance. Like I'd imagine, uh, you know, uh, non-Caucasian people would be using or be involved uh, with anonymous more than a composition of, say, for example, American society, maybe more females. And, and that's why they their their voice is extremely interesting. I think that there's some fundamental flaws. I'm a big believer in natural law, which discusses about not encroaching on other people's property to some extent, and um, basically doing all that you say you're going to do. The the ambiguous part is property, because one could state that the people own the state and the information of the state belongs to the people, and that, that becomes a little convoluted, right, in terms of morality question. But, but it is definitely an, an interesting 
voice as as of late, and I, I wonder how bigger, much bigger these these entities are going to be. And another interesting thing is that the big popular website, the piracy website, Pirate Bay, right, despite as much intervention by states and governments and, and corporations to try to stop it, technology and, and these groups, for example, uh, let's call these groups pirates rather than hackers, are, are still striving to find ways to, to play a role in, in society as well. So it's quite interesting, Mm. Yeah, and I, and I don't know what the demographic makeup of these groups is, but they sort of—it seems to sort of fit more of the collective. Well, from the government's perspective, they would be seen as sort of, an, a, you know, anarchists or anti-authoritarian, et cetera. Right. But there is a sort of democratic kind of ethos, as you say, uh, to it. And one of the things that I think that is actually something worth pointing out that's a positive aspect of cyberspace that, you know, that groups like Anonymous are to some extent sort of embracing is the open nature of the internet and the idea that it should be a space uh, that is not surveilled and not restricted by governments. I mean, but that at the same time is also one of the things that makes the internet very vulnerable and very dangerous. So, you know, uh, I suppose if there's a positive aspect to what groups like Anonymous are doing, by testing the limits of the open internet, they're sort of, we're, we, every time this, you know, when they do this, we are sort of beginning to understand, like, what should the norms of behavior be? What should the kind of rules of the road be? Um, and those aren't going to be made up by governments so much. Mm-hmm. Those are going to be made up by behavior and by actions, both by official groups and unofficial groups like Anonymous. Okay, so Shane, I want to add two more fun questions, and, and we'll call it a day. In, in terms of, like, since you've been covering this, this space, I, I like to ask you a personal question in terms of like technology, the devices you're using. Um, I've heard people discuss about like even concerns of having laptops with webcams on it, even if it's not activated, it could be a potentially a, a information leak. So where you know people could intrude in your privacy. Are you extra paranoid in terms of the technological devices you're using on a daily basis? To, to basically conduct and, and live your life? Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> you are? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that, um, you know, particularly being a journalist, um, uh-huh. there are, are things that I do to protect my communications and um, that might not do if I weren't uh, having sensitive conversations with people. But, um, you know, look, I use, uh, uh, in some cases, I use uh, encrypted phone, encrypted messaging systems. I use right. encrypted email. Uh, I use a passcode, password locker. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm, and I'm also just generally very cautious about, you know, what I say in any form that's uh, indelible. So <laughs> what right. you say in emails, these kinds of things. Uh, but I think that this is, you know, I think we're all going to have to get a lot smarter about how we protect ourselves, not just from, from, from governments and even from corporations that want our data, but from criminals, obviously, as well. I think we're, we're entering into a phase now in our sort of social existence with cyberspace and in cyberspace where we're going to have to start learning the basics of things like looking both ways when you cross the street and not talking to strangers. You know, the equivalent of that is don't open emails from people you don't know. Don't click on links that weren't sent that you don't know were sent to you. Mm-hmm. Be careful which websites you're visiting that might have malware on them. Um, you know, be careful about who you hand personal information to. Um, use hard to guess passwords. All these things that people are now starting to understand that are going to give everyone you know, a, a measurably greater degree of security than they had before. These are all things that people are just going to have to start doing. We can't just take for granted that we're not vulnerable or, oh, I only use, you know, the Internet for email. Well, no, your personal information is out on the, out on the Internet in ways that you don't even have access to anymore. Right, um, witness, right. you know, when Home Depot or Target gets hacked. That was them getting hacked, not you, but now, the, now someone has your credit card information. So we're all just going to have to get a lot smarter about this. And companies in particular that are vulnerable are going to have to start reevaluating their own risk models. Um, right. You know, one of the things I found fascinating after the Target and Home Depot hacks is, you know, is who's liable for that? Is it, can, and can the banks go back and demand from Home Depot and Target that they pay for the costs incurred for processing, you know, a hundred million new debit cards. I, my understanding is that they're they're pushing that right now, and there's a question of who pays for all of this. Right. Uh, you know, the, the cost incurred are not just the cost of 
you know, installing a firewall and antivirus protection on your network. It's also what happens when something goes wrong. Who right. is liable for that? These, these are, we're just now beginning to sort these questions out, but they're, 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 they're central to how we do cybersecurity uh, for, for you know, the coming decades, really. Right, right. Interesting. Okay, Shane, let, let's end this interview by playing a fun word association game. You know the rules <laughs> okay. of the game, right? I'm just going to mention a word. You tell me first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, that helps sure. us cover some interesting subjects that we maybe haven't discussed about in depth yet. Okay. All right. First word, the cloud. Big. Okay. Online banking. Safe. Apple. The company. <laughs> uh, uh, essential. Essential. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Iran. Growing threat. Interesting. Cryptocurrencies. Undecided. Mm. The NSA. <laughs> Watching. <laughs> Interesting. Blackberry. What? Blackberry. No, I said who? Oh, what? What? Okay. <laughs> Interesting. For, forgotten. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. This interview. Uh, enjoyable. Thank you, Shane. It was great talking to you. Thanks, Peter. I had a lot of fun. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com. 